So welcome everyone to uh, Grand Rounds. And so we're, we're just starting off on our series of resident Grand Rounds and I think that it's always a big milestone as I tell the residents, it's part of collective anxiety. So when you're a resident, I think that there are probably three or four things that you worry about. One is uh, presenting your Grand Rounds, two is finding a fellowship, three is passing your APCP boards or parts thereof, and four is finding a job. So. Congratulations, you're, you're achieving one of those important milestones. You've already achieved two at this point. But so, uh, Dr. Plummer uh, hails to us from Kansas, and we were really lucky to recruit her to our program because she was able to do a post-sophomore fellowship at the University of Kansas. And so she came and she interviewed for our program. I didn't get a chance to interview her, but I met her when she came, and she was really excited about hematopathology. Subsequently, she went through our APCP training, and she had uh, broad exposure to many disciplines. And what she decided she liked best were both hematopathology and cytology. Now we were really trying really hard to get her to stay with us to do a hematopathology fellowship and a cytopathology fellowship. However, for personal and professional reasons, she found some fabulous opportunities at the University of Kansas. Now, as Regina and I worked together over the last four years, we spent a lot of time working one-on-one -on, -one on cases. And Regina said, you know, I don't really think that I'm into research because uh, it's just I want to work in community practice or I'm not sure what I want to do. But what I encourage her to do is I, I said find a clinical problem that's interesting to you and we'll turn it into an eclipse abstract. It could be something that's related to quality assurance or a practice that you don't like or you think is very favorable. We could study it systematically and we could describe the findings and maybe change practice. And so Regina was really interested in looking at GI mucosal biopsies and how uh, you know the habit that if you make tests available, clinicians will order everything and everyone. It may not necessarily serve the clinical practice uh, best in terms of utilization. So without much further ado, Dr. Plummer, I'm really excited to hear your talk. Today she will be talking about how we use flow cytometry in the diagnosis of GI hematolymphoid neoplasms. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Linden. Um, as you mentioned, I, I, in the time I've been here, I was I started off saying, yeah, I'm going to go into heme, but after rotating through everything, turns out I love heme and cyto and GI. <laughs> and uh, actually, I'm, I'm very passionate about QA work and proper lab utilization, and I'm grateful to be in a program that really starts that training off early. Uh, we actually first encounter, depending on whether you rotate on heme or the VA first, at the VA we do have the opportunity of starting our own QA project there, um, and it's right up my alley, it's tangible, it's fixable. Um, so without further ado, um, the role of flow cytometry in the diagnosis of GI hematolymphoid neoplasms, um, or put another way, putting my training in both anatomic pathology and clinical pathology to good use. I have more than three objectives uh, for this talk. I want you to understand uh, the role endoscopy plays in the diagnosis of GI lymphoma and the endoscopic characteristics associated with GI lymphoma. Uh, recall some of the more common hematolymphoid malignancies of the GI tract, recognize the role flow cytometry plays in the diagnosis of GI lymphoma, and last but certainly not least, appreciate the role the pathologist can play in improving lab test utilization. So when residents rotate on any heme rotation here, we have the opportunity to participate in a lymphoma protocol. And a lymphoma protocol is, happens when a clinician sends fresh tissue to our gross lab. Um, with a suspicion that there might be a hematolymphoid malignancy. And with that tissue, we do some touch preps. Uh, we'll stain one of those touch preps with DIFQUIC so we can uh, ascertain whether we have good tissue there or not. And we'll do unstains for possible fish testing, and then we'll further divide the tissue between formalin fix for microscopic examination, put some in RPMI for flow cytometry, and then put some more in RPMI for cytogenetic tests. And I was paged to the gross room multiple times for lymphoma protocols uh, to be performed on endoscopically acquired GI biopsies. And I found that they do just, they don't touch off. <laughs> and I think it's because of their mucoid nature. I mean, you have mucus lining your entire GI tract and everything just sort of smears. Moreover, 70% of your immune system resides in your GI tract. And other non lymphomatous entities, um, from infection, gastritis, celiac disease, IBD, all have inflammatory infiltrate there. And uh, 
it's uh, lymphoid. And so what little we're able to touch off, we're very, it's very difficult for us to say whether that's lymphoma or not. Um, so I, had, there had, I decided there had to be a better way. <laughs> Uh, moreover, I was very irritated that uh, the endoscopists here have the, um, the habit of sending multiple GI biopsies from the same exam. So I'd get five biopsies from the same exam and they want order flow in every single piece. Um, so we approached it a couple different ways. We have run flow in every single piece. We've combined pieces, so part of the ascending colon, combined with the cecum to improve um, cellul cellularity of the specimen and also to decrease cost of the patient for the patient. Uh, but there had to be a reason they're doing this, so I did speak to one of my GI colleagues who performs endoscopic exams here, and I said, hey, what are you looking for uh, when you're looking for lymphoma, um, or is it more of a cl clinical suspicion? And he said, there are certain th characteristics, findings of lymphoma, particularly follicular lymphoma, but otherwise it's clinical suspicion. So. Uh, not a super helpful answer, but what I got was, yeah, we look for some things, but more often than not, it's based off their history. So, in regards to GI lymphomas, the GI tract is the most common site, primary site of extranodal lymphomas. Uh, the GI tract lymphomas account for about 20% of all non-Hodgkin's non lymphomas, and predisposing factors include infection, especially H. pylori infection of the stomach, uh, <laughs> celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, the entity itself, the disease itself, but also some of the drugs used to treat inflammatory bowel disease can predispose a patient to hematolymphoid malignancy, and some immunodeficiency syndromes can also predispose you to GI lymphomas. <laughs> Within the GI tract, the stomach is the most common site for a GI, primary GI, GI lymphoma, followed by the small bowel. Uh, within the small bowel, ileum is the most common site. Within the colon, the cecum is the most common site, followed by the rectum. Uh, and then primary and secondary uh, involvement of the esophagus is extraordinarily rare. In fact, when I performed this project, we actually had no, no samples submitted from the esophagus. Um, and when it does present, you're more likely to have a single portion of the GI tract involved as opposed to multiple portions. So I'm gonna follow a biopsy from in vivo to our lab. So when an endoscopist is looking for lymphoma in the stomach, they look for large infiltrated brugge, eroded nodules, exophytic or ulcerated masses, and patient characteristics could be anything from dyspepsia to gastric outlet obstruction if the mass is large enough, to even delay gastric emptying if you have diffuse infiltration of the gastric wall. And over here on the left side of the screen, uh, this is actually diffuse large B-cell lymphoma presenting as a submucosal ulcerated mass. But unfortunately, these findings are not uh, specific for lymphoma. They could al you could also find solitary ulcers in peptic ulcer disease. You could have a mass looking like adenocarcinoma or a soft tissue tumor. And when you have those infiltrated rugal folds, that could be litinitis plastica, portal hypertensive gastropathy, or even H. pylori infection. Within the small bowel, similarly, you can have nodular or polypoid lesions that are the same color as the surrounding tissue. And you could also have erosions, effacement of the circular folds. Patients will present with vague abdominal pain, weight loss, anorexia and obstruction if the mass is large enough. Photos here are of a lymphoma of the ileum manifesting as a submucosal nodular mass here, and then these are focal ulcerations, shallow ulcer erosions. Once again, there's quite a differential for this endoscopic appearance, anything from normal pyrus patches in the ileum, um, and anything that can cause lymphoid hyperplasia, including viral gastroenteritis, uh, ulcerative jade uninus, any submucosal tumor, Crohn's disease, and AIDS enteropathy. And within the colon, you'll once again have a discrete polypoid mass, broad or ulcerating or obstructing mass, subtle mucosal thickening, nodularity, irregular shallow ulceration. Um, and in the colon, these masses have a chance to become larger than they do in other areas of the GI tract, and so they're more likely to present with obstruction or bleeding, and here we have polypoid masses um, with focal bleeding. 
Once again, there is a different differential diagnosis. So reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. I actually saw this while I was doing four months of GI here, uh, back to back, and it, they thought this person was going to have some sort of either lymphoma or uh, uh, some other malignancy because they just she had so many polyps, but it was just reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. Um, any large polyp can be a carcinoma. I also, in reading, I found that you can also have melanoma or tuberculosis of the colon present this way. And in the photo, that this is this, this is what lymphoid hyperplasia looks like in the colon. Okay, so brief overview: uh, fast and furious through some GI lymphomas. Start out with the queen bee, which is marginal zone lymphoma, also called malt lymphoma. So malt lymphoma is the mo most commonly involves the stomach. The uh, intestinal involvement shows preference for the rectum. Medium age of a patient is in the seventh decade for the stomach and quote unquote middle age for the intestinal malt lymphoma. It can be associated with chronic inflammatory states, especially within the stomach. Uh, plus or minus H. pylori infection can be associated with some, pa some papers out there have now, are now arguing there's no correlation. Um, autoimmune gastritis as well is associated with malt lymphoma. Uh, and unlike uh, other parts of the GI tract, malt lymphoma, uh, especially when it involves the stomach, it, it'll present as that patient has GERD or dyspepsia. Uh, you're not going to be thinking this patient might have lymphoma. Um, less likely they're going to have nausea, vomiting, bleeding, weight loss. Um, intestinal involvement, they can have obstructive, obstruction and bleeding. So on endoscopy, on endoscopy, this type of lymphoma often consists of erosion, shallow, shallow ulcers, mucosal granularity, or uh, thickening of the mucosal folds. Um, here in this photo, you have a patient. This is a patient from our data set, and this is actually a malt lymphoma within the cecum presenting as a fungating, partially obstructing mass. So on microscopy, this is considered a low-grade lymphoma. You'll have diffuse or vaguely nodular infiltrate of small or medium-sized cells with slightly irregular nuclei and distinct rim of, rim of clear cytoplasm. Occla occasionally, it can have plasmacytic differentiation, um, and the neoplastic cells uh, often infiltrate and disrupt the glands. This is known as a lymphoepithelial lesion, and this is something that's really driven home for the residents to look for, uh, which is, hold on, can you see the mouse if I use it? No. Here, so we have disruption of the glands here. So, um, and then the lymphoma cells can also sometimes colonize some of the germinal centers. So we have a more no normal germinal center here, um, but that can really uh, confuse the picture for follicular lymphoma. By uh, flow cytometry, we're going to have a CD20, CD19 positive population. Those are two B cell markers. Um, it can also be CD79A positive. When we look at B cell lymphomas by flow cytometry, we tend to have, uh, group them into CD5 positive B cell lymphomas, CD10 positive B cell lymphomas, or typically negative for both. Um, this one happens to be negative for both. Um, and here, so CD5 is typically a T cell marker, and this is what we have over here in our gray population. So we do have a uh, CD5 negative population. And if this line was drawn over here, yeah, you'd say maybe it was positive, but it's actually dimmer than the background T cells. Um, it's also CD10 negative, and this is kappa monotypic. Moving on to follicular lymphoma, I wasn't going to include this because it is actually a rarer lymphoma within the GI tract, accounting for less than 4% of all primary GI lymphomas, but because it has the, a look that endoscopists look for, uh, I'll, I decided to do include it. It does have a slight female predominance, um, and the small intestine is most often affected, especially the second portion of the duodenum, and the clinical presentation is that of abdominal pain, uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, bleeding. You're going to see a lot of the same presenting symptoms <laughs> for all of these. So, um, on endoscopy, this is what uh, my colleague on GI was talking about. So endoscopy, nodularity of the mucosa is the most common finding, uh, sometimes with the picture of what they call multiple lymphomatous polyposis, which is what's in this photo. And uh, the nodules are typically one to two millimeters in diameter, and they tend to be white to off-white. 
And um, the appearance is, this appearance is more common in follicular lymphomas um, that involve the second portion of the duodenum, so you might not see this multiple lymphomatous polyposis elsewhere, arising elsewhere in the GI tract. Um, and lymphomas, uh, these lymphomas may be combined to the bowel wall or they may show regional nodal involvement simultaneously. A microscopy, follicular lymphoma is considered a low-grade lymphoma, much like uh, 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 marginal zone lymphoma, and it consists of follicles that usually lack mantles and are composed of monotonous population of centrocytes. Uh, very often there are increased numbers of lymphoid cells outside of the follicles, and what we can see here is um, expansion of the lamina propria by lymphoid infiltrate and sort of plumping up of the villi, or what used to be villi, because they have been taken over by lymphoma cells. Um, then lymphoepithelial lesions, like you would see in uh, marginal zone lymphoma, are typically absent from follicular lymphoma, and unlike follicular lymphoma diagnosed in the lymph nodes, which can be uh, of a higher grade, usually when they're diagnosed in the GI tract, they are of a lower grade, grade one or two. By flow cytometry, once again, it's a B cell lymphoma, so we have CD20, CD19 positivity. This happens to be one of the CD10 po uh, positive lymphomas, and once again, we have a kappa monotypic population here. They're negative for CD5, so when we're looking at our algorithm for uh, B cell lymphomas, it helps us decide uh, what track to take. Moving on to mantle cell lymphoma. So mantle cell lymphoma uh, usually manifests with actual widespread disease and involvement of the GI tract is not uncommon, it's common. Um, any portion of the GI tract may be infected, uh, affected and whereas I said lymphomas are more likely to affect one site within the GI tract only, um, this is the one that can affect multiple simultaneously. Uh, it tends to affect patients less than 50 years old with a male predominance and once again, Similar presentation, abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloody stool, weight loss. Uh, predispo predisposing factors for this particular lymphoma are not currently known. And um, like follicular lymphoma, it can present as multiple lymphomatous polyposis. This is the same exact picture I used for the prior. Um, the ileocecal region, when it is involved, tends to have the largest polyps. And in the stomach, it can take the form of small number of protruded, ulcerated, or fold thickening lesions. By microscopy, you'll see a band-like infiltrate or multiple ill-defined nodules. So we have a nice band-like infiltrate here. Um, and the cells are atypical, but yet monotonous. Uh, they tend to be slightly larger and irregular than normal lymphocytes. They have a scant amount of cytoplasm with conspicuous nucleoli. Um, single epithelioid histocytes can be seen, as seen here. And uh, these, once again, these cells don't typically form uh, the the lesions affecting, like actually infiltrating the glands, um, but they can displace the glands. Mm -hmm. By flow, once again, B cell lymphoma, we have CD19, CD20 positivity. Uh, this one is a CD5 positive lymphoma, and it's variable CD10, so typically we don't think about uh, lymphomas being both CD5 positive and CD10 positive, but this is one of the rare ones where you can pick up 10 as well. Um, the one, uh, in my study here, it happened to be uh, 10 negative, um, and then could be negative for CD23, which is also a B cell marker, um, and light chain restricted. Here we have a lambda restricted population. Okay, moving on, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So diffuse large B cell lymphoma, or DLBCL, uh, is the most common intestinal lymphoma, um, so non-gastric. Um, median age uh, tends to be older adults, and presentation is often that of a palpable mass. So that is one way this uh, lymphoma can differ from the other lymphomas. Uh, it can grow to such a large state that you can actually palpate it. Um, regional lymph nodes are almost always involved if in a patient that has uh, intestinal diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So if a clinician were to order imaging prior to performing that endoscopy, it could really uh, improve our uh, the positive, uh, pro positive predictive value of our flow cytometry. Uh, uh, some cases do arise de novo, but others arise as a large cell transformation of marginal zone lymphoma. It 
And because, as I mentioned, it usually uh, rises as a large mass. It's a single, but occasionally multiple large ulcerated exophytic lesions. This is actually a patient in our study. This was a, uh, I think, a cecal mass, and it was um, nearly obstructing um, his, his uh, lumen here. By microscopy, you can see here, uh, we have large cells of round oval irregular nuclei. Some of them are uh, lobated, distinct nucleoli. Um, they're large cells, and we can see that by, if you look at, this is a gland, um, and check out the size of the nucleoli here, and the lymphoma cells are not too much different in size here. Um, here is a remnant of the muscularis mucosi, or uh, not the muscularis mucosi. I'm having a brain, brain fart. But um, uh, <laughs> anyway, it's going through the lamina propria um, and uh, extending downward. Um, all right, so diffuse large B cell lymphoma can have a variable immune phenotype because it can either rise de novo or from other lymphomas. Uh, it will be positive for CD19 and CD20, the B cell markers. The one we have in our uh, example here is CD10 positive. Um, as well as 20 and 19. And then we have CD5 here, for which it is <coughs> negative, compared to the background T cells, we do have kappa positivity. So most de novo gastric diffuse large B cell lymphomas are going to be that of a germinal center type. So we use the Hansel algorithm to sort of parse out whether it's going to be germinal center type or uh, a non-germinal center B cell type. So non-germinal center B cell type is going to be uh, CD10 negative, BCL6 positive, and MUM1 positive. So MUM1 is a marker of more mature B cells. And then uh, the DLBCLs that arise de novo from the intestine tend to be uh, germinal center type, which is, can either be CD10 positive, CD10 is a marker of more immature cells, immature B cells, um, or if it is CD10 negative, they will be BCL6 positive and MUM1 negative. Burkitt lymphoma is worth mentioning. So Burkitt lymphoma is highly aggressive and, aggressive and rapidly growing. It is partially defined by the presence of a translocation involving uh, the MIC gene. There are three clinical variants of Burkitt lymphoma described, endemic, sporadic, and immunodeficiency associated. And interestingly, involvement of the ileocecal region is actually the most common manifestation of sporadic Burkitt lymphoma and accounts for about 5% of all intestinal lymphomas. It does affect children uh, and young adults more uh, than adults and does have a marked male predominance. And about a third of them are EBV associated. Uh, this is the same picture of our, our gentleman with a few large B cell lymphoma. However, um, Burke is gonna look exactly the same on endoscopy. It's gonna be a large <laughs> exophytic lesion sometimes with ulceration. By microscopy, uh, Burkitt lymphoma will be a diffuse infiltrate, densely packed, packing the mucosa uh, by uniform medium-sized cells with round nuclei, granular chromatin, three to four nucleoli, and a distinct deeply basophilic cytoplasm. There are typically t uh, numerous tangible body macrophages as seen here, and that gives that uh, bored, fodder, starry sky appearance. Um, characteristic, uh, and then the mitotic rate is usually very high. So if we were to throw a KI-67 on this, it'd be close to 100%. Uh, it is a B cell lymphoma, so we do have CD20 and CD19 positivity. It, it happens to be one of our CD10 positive B cell lymphomas, and it can show light chain restriction. And because it's CD10 positive, we have CD5 and BCL2 negative if you were to throw IHC on a uh, section. Uh, moving on to our only T-cell lymphoma, I will be mentioning enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma. And with a name like that, you think it might involve a GI tract. Um, so enteropathy T-cell-associated T-cell lymphoma, or EATL, is the most common T-cell lymphoma uh, to arise in the intestine. I use most common a lot. Most common to involve the stomach most common to involve the intestine. This is the most common T-cell lymphoma. Uh, it happens to have two types. Type one is associated with celiac disease, 
And type 2, uh, which is not associated with celiac disease, is seen more often in East Asian populations with a male to female ratio of about 3 to 1. Uh, presentation, very similar to the ones we mentioned. However, uh, the texts I read made a point to uh, of saying uh, EATL will act, can actually present with intestinal perforation, unlike the others, uh, or more likely to present with intestinal perforation. Uh, like diffuse large B cell lymphoma, you'll usually have mesenteric lymphadenopathy, so performing some imaging before endoscopy can uh, heighten your awareness that you might be dealing with a lymphoma. And uh, among intestinal lymphomas, it does have the worst prognosis. So EATL, often confined to the, confined to the small intestine, uh, often the jejunum or ileum, and lesions can be multiple or single. And take the form of plaques or nodules usually, or strictures, they don't often form a large mass. What we have in our photos here is from a patient in our study set with EATL, and this first photo here is uh, from the ascending colon, and it's a large non-bleeding ulceration, and the bottom photo is of a bleeding ulceration. So the microscopic examination of EATL reveals a dense, diffuse infiltrate of atypical lymphoid cells associated with ulceration and variable admixture of other types of inflammatory cells, which I found interesting. You're not just having a back-to-back uh, -back, uh, lymphocytes. They tend to hang out with other uh, admixture of inflammatory cells. Uh, the neoplastic cells tend to be medium to large, and they can be quite anaplastic at times, which is what we see here. This is an anaplastic version. And um, you can also see if it is celiac associated, celiac disease, you, you'll see in the background the changes of celiac disease along with the, the malignancy. So here we have flattening of the villi with crypt hyperplasia as well. And also of note with this uh, lymphoma, you can see it hanging out in the vessels. I know it's really small to you, but this is a vessel down in the submucosa and it is chock full of these cells. <coughs> Whereas with um, B cells, we tend to look for CD5 positivity or CD10 positivity to help categorize it. T cell lymphomas tend to announce their aberrancy by dropping typical T cell markers. So that's what we look for um, when we're looking at flow or is do we have T cell markers that are expressing only some T cell markers, uh, T cells that express some T cell markers and not others. So here we have uh, uh, type, so type 1 uh, EATL maintains T cell markers C3 and 7. So we have 7 here, 3 and 7 positivity. And um, if the more anaplastic versions, uh, as seen in the prior slide, can express CD30 positivity as well. They are usually negative for CD2, 4, 5, and 8, which are all T cell markers. The one we have here, we have... Uh, this is CD4, and our population of blue here is uh, negative for CD4 and CD5, negative for CD5. This one happened to have some dim CD8 positivity retained. Um, and they almost always drop CD1A, TDT, and CD57. Now, have a couple circled because, like, as I mentioned, there's type 1 and type 2. And type 2 is more often to express CD8 and CD56. And I actually think this patient, because this is from a patient of ours, I think he did have type 2. So it makes sense that we have um, some dim CD8 positivity. All right, last but not least, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. This is a transplant center, so this is usually the biggest indication we get these biopsies for. Um, PTLDs, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders, um, they're lymphoid or plasmacytic proliferations that develop as a consequence of immunosuppression in a recipient of either a solid <coughs> organ or a stem cell transplant. Uh, PTLDs often, uh, often can occur anywhere, but they do often uh, occur in the GI tract, and most PTLDs are EBV-associated. Uh, in fact, EBV seronegativity at the time of transplant, so if you were EBV seronegative um, at the time of transplant, once you're immunosuppressed, you're more likely to develop a PTLD. 
um, and you're more likely to develop a PTLD if you are on a stronger immunosuppressive regimen. I found this interesting. So um, you're more likely to develop a PTLD if uh, you have had a certain transplant versus others. So patients receiving a renal allograft are less likely to develop PTLD, whereas those in, uh, receiving a lung or intestinal allograft are, uh, have the highest likelihood of developing. Um, often presents within one year of, de of transplant, however, has been seen in greater than 10 years, rarely. So PTLD has various classifications. There are four major classifications, uh, non-destructive PTLDs, polymorphic PTLDs, and monomorphic PTLDs, cl and classical Hodgkin lymphoma PTLDs. So uh, the monomorphic PTLDs look exactly like the lymphomas in uh, patients that are not immunosuppressed, and they're going to present exactly like the ones I have just spoken about. Um, and I won't all be talking about the non-destructive PTLDs uh, because these lesions often occur in children and they often affect the tonsils. And moreover, um, the flow cytometry plays little role in their diagnosis because they often don't have an aberrant immunophenotype. Um, they just know they're um, abnormal by their, their growth and their EBV positivity. But polymorphic PTLD is worth mentioning here. So by microscopy, polymorphic PTLD is characterized by effacement of the underlying tissue architecture and uh, EBV positivity, either by immunohistochemistry or in situ hybridization. Uh, polymorphic PTLD shows a full range of B cell maturation, so from uh, your immunoblast all the way to your mature plasma cell, and it will have some light chain restriction. And there will typically be heterogeneous T cells in the background as well. Of note, um, affecting the GI tract, uh, there is a lesion called the EBV positive mucocutaneous ulcer, which uh, in part was described by our own Robert McKenna. Um, these on endoscopy, like the name implies, you'll see ulceration. And the morphologic characteristics vary, but typically include mixed hematolymphoid infiltrate, background of necrosis and ulceration, and then uh, cells uh, that infiltrate and consist of small T cells, large lymphocytes, even some reed sternberg like cells, and they typically are CD30 positive. Okay, that was our whirlwind of GI lymphoma overview. Um, but to recap, and why the study is important, um, the patient presentation for GI lymphoma can be nonspecific. Endoscopic appearance can be nonspecific. Our current protocol uh, is relatively unhelpful in triaging these. So we're having various levels of inability to triage these specimens. Um, and as a transplant center, we need a better way of triaging these specimens because we have a patient population that's more likely to have GI lymphoma. Um, so I asked, can we do things better? And the answer is, yes, we can. Okay. So methods. So this study consisted of two phases. The first phase was the data mining phase. What we did, um, I, uh, Chris Bergstead, uh, who is the executive assistant uh, within HEME. Uh, she helped me perform some natural language searches within COPATH uh, from the years 2012 to 2017. We just looked for all parts of the GI tract um, for on associated with flow specimens. We excluded uh, bi open biopsies, so excisions, re resection specimens, and specimens from any patient uh, under the age of 18 because that created a whole nother IRB layer I didn't want to encounter. Um, and then for each flow case included in the study, we reviewed their medical records, any associated microscopic diagnoses, pertinent patient history, endos endoscopy indication, relevant endoscopic and imaging findings. And after data analysis, uh, we proposed this new testing algorithm, which was meant to enhance pathology team's role in flow test utilization. So. In our department, or at least at the time I started the study, we had a 24-hour turnaround time on all biopsies. Um, the new algor algorithm proposed we hold uh, the flow that was meant for uh, specimen that was meant for flow under refrigeration in RPMI for 24 hours while we waited for the biopsy to come out, and that gave us an opportunity to actually look at, lay some eyes on the slide, um, and say, yeah, this probably is lymphoma and worth uh, submitting for flow cytometry. 
Um, and of note, the endoscopists here are in the habit of, if they're going to submit a specimen for flow, they essentially take a biopsy immediately adjacent to each other. So one's for micro and one microscopic examination, and then one is for flow cytometry. Um, and then, so it gives us the decision of whether or not this is an appropriate sample for flow. And of note, um, this method of triaging is already in place uh, in our cytopathology department. Um, so if a patient has an endoscopic ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration, um, they have the ability to do rapid on-site evaluation um, when in the OR. So they can lay eyes on the specimen and sort of look at some of the characteristics of whether this might be lymphoma or not, the lesions. So if it looks like a monotonous uh, lymphoid population, on uh, fine needle aspiration, they'll uh, send it for flow, but if not, they might wait and hold it under refrigeration. Okay, our second phase uh, was to initiate this proposed protocol and uh, pull the H&E slides uh, of associated with the, case, the flow cases, and then I had two senior pathology residents and one board, board certified metapathologist screen the slides, um, and a de-identified synopsis of the endoscopy port in clinical note was associated with the slides. Um, so it was like they were looking at them in real time. And I chose uh, to have a hematopathologist be the screener instead of one of our GI faculty, um, because I actually proposed this to a member of our uh, GI faculty. And I said, hey, um, would you be the screener on this? Um, or should I have him do it? And he said, hey, if there is lymphoma or PTLD at all in the consideration, or clinic, clinical, I'm gonna have heme bless it anyway before I sign it out, so I just might as well send it to heme. Um, and after the reviewers examined it, um, like I said, they can, they can choose whether to do flow or not. So results, the good stuff. Um, we ended up finding 54 cases uh, corresponding to 32 patients on 33 separate collection dates. Um, Sixty-six percent of the patients had a history of transplant, either solid o organ or a stem cell, um, or prior hematologic malignancy, and therefore um, recurrent lymphoma or PTLD were of diagnostic consideration at time of endoscopy. Uh, of the other patients, um, they either had a combination of clinical or endoscopic or radiographic findings that tipped the clinician off. And then from these specimens, 22 percent of them came from the stomach, whereas uh, the, from the small intestine and colon, uh, they were 39% each. Uh, so these are the microscopic diagnoses. I tend to uh, lump a bit here. So about 24% of the specimens submitted carried a final morphologic diagnosis of no diagnostic abnormality. Um, and then coming in second was nonspecific inflammation, and in that group was just chronic gastritis. Uh, there were also diagnoses of IBD, infection, other inflammatory conditions such as peptic duodenitis, GBHD, drug toxicity. One of them turned out to be adenocarcinoma. And then I have two here that say no morphologic diagnosis was rendered. Um, it's about 4%, but it was two cases because those two cases were only flow was done. They didn't submit anything for microscopic examination, um, which I think is more, those two specimens actually came from like uh, ridges or one of the outside for review institutions. Um, and then about 15%, uh, which totaled eight cases, were actually positive, uh, positive or suggestive for lymphoma by microscopy. So all 46 cases that were negative for lymphoma by morphologic assessment, by no surprise, were actually negative for uh, lymphoma by flow as well, which is another way of saying flow is non contributory in about 85% of the cases. So there had to be a reason they sent them, right? So um, endoscopic findings. Most common endoscopic finding was um, uh, inflammation characterized by erythema, congestion, altered vascularity, and this was seconded by ulceration. Of note, 11 specimens were taken from areas of the GI tract that look completely normal, and uh, one patient had a completely normal exam and she had stuff sent for flow. Um, and not surprisingly, all but one of the specimens for which there was normal endoscopic findings showed no diagnostic abnormality. 
by uh, morphology, and the one outlier was one uh, that was called reactive gastropathy. All right. So this is a table of our eight positive cases, and if you count, that's actually seven patients, but the one in the middle had two specimens submitted from the same exam, so we ended up having eight positive flow cases. And of note, the two on the bottom uh, actually were endoscopic ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration specimens, and therefore they had a rapid on-site evaluation within the OR. And for those of you who don't know what we do there with our cytopathology specimens, we actually go to the OR, um, the, the endoscopist uh, hands over the specimen, we spit it onto a slide and do a diff quick stain and look at it under the scope and we say, yes, we have lesional tissue or no, we do not. And also from this we can say, well, this is all lymphocytes. This is not carcinoma. And well, these are all the same lymphocytes and we don't have a polymorphous population. Um, so if we see that in the OR, um, we can actually, without the, without the clinician even asking us to say, hey, put some in flow, we're sending this, or, or put some in rp and we're sending this for flow. And actually, uh, Dr. Hector Mesa at our VA just uh, published a paper uh, explaining the utility of rapid on-site evaluation and how it is actually very critical um, in proving test utilization for ancillary studies like flow cytometry in fish. So he might be onto something. Of our small N positive cases, five of them had uh, radio uh, radiologic uh, masses or uh, abnormalities, and this was redemonstrated on endoscopy uh, within four of them. They were able to redemonstrate the mass um, or saw the mass on endoscopy. So within this data set, um, having a mass or abnormal imaging um, was our biggest indicator that our flow is going to be positive. And these are our final diagnoses over here. Uh, for our positive cases, we had a diff uh, monomorphic PTLD, diffuse large B cell type. Um, this patient, uh, we were unable to further characterize as they were lost to follow up. We did have, uh, yeah, he was a type 2 EATL. Um, another diffuse, oh, this was a 2 4. He had diffuse large B cell lymphoma and CLL. Um, another monomorphic PTLD, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and one. Uh, mantle cell lymphoma. <coughs> I also wanted to note, so um, early on um, in the talk I had mentioned that uh, we had gotten in the habit of combining some of the, the GI biopsies to improve uh, cellularity because some of the viability of these GI biopsies isn't that great. Um, so cellular viability ranged from 1 to 88 percent with median viability of 14 percent. <coughs> And low viability of these specimens can affect how many uh, tubes we can run or uh, how many markers we can uh, utilize to characterize the cells present. Um, so the least amount applied was eight markers, which is about a B cell tube, so looking at only B cell markers, and the most applied was 17. So um, what I just told you, so all the data from the first pa phase, we were allowed, uh, we were, was uh, allowed to do a poster presentation at uh, Eclipse in Houston this past year, and the poster was very well received. I had a handful of uh, docs there saying, we have this exact problem at our hospital. I would really like to see this data published so I can say, hey, we're not doing this anymore. Um, and that really encouraged me to go through with the second phase of this study. So second phase, uh, pulled the slides of all the cases, uh, all the slides associated with the flow cases, and we were able to pull uh, 49 of the 54, find 49 of the 54 cases, 41 of the 46 negative cases, and uh, all slides from all the positive cases. Do I have that? I do. All right. Um, so when reviewing the cases, uh, which were negative for hemato hematologic malignancy by flow, um, at least one of the three reviewing staff canceled the test, so they were able to recognize this is not a lymphomatous process and canceled the test in 88% uh, of the of, uh, slides reviewed or cases reviewed. And uh, there was a unanimous agreement to cancel flow in 37% of the negative tests. And uh, I was further encouraged that we are good pathologists and we're able to identify lymphoma by looking at it. So that's nice. We, they were able to identify all the, all the ones that were actually lymphomatous and sent those all appropriately for flow. 
So conclusions and discussion. So flow ended up being non-contributory in about 85% of, of the cases submitted. Um, therefore, uh, maybe the, the provider submitted uh, biopsies uh, is non-contributory is, is non in the overall diagnosis of GI lymphoma. Moreover, um, at least one of the reviewing staff uh, canceled the study in 88% of the negative cases, and there was a unanimous agreement in, review, in reviewers to pursue flow in all the positive ca cases. Conclusion, um, implementing an algorithm um, that promotes pathologist screening or intervention is an effective method of triaging these GI biopsies. Um, moreover, I would also like to add uh, when possible, if there is an actual mass seen on endoscopy and the uh, clinician is skilled in endos endoscopic ultrasound, maybe performing a fine needle aspiration and rapid on-site evaluation is also an effective way to triage these cases. Um, I was also very interested in how much money uh, could have been saved on the patient side because I have been a patient and I have received flow cytometry and it ain't cheap. So. Um, Effective triaging uh, would have decreased test utilization overall in 60% of the cases. This amounts to $16,000 in lab charges. Um, some of these patients uh, had flow performed on multiple biopsies from the same endoscopic exam, which for them would amount to about uh, $2,100 in charges. Um, on average, each patient would have saved about $444, and uh, important to us in the lab is that we could have better, better utilized our materials and uh, personnel uh, not running unnecessary tests. So these are my resources. Um, and I have so many thanks to give, especially Dr. Linden, for that warm introduction and uh, really encouraging me to go through the, with this when I came back storming and fuming, saying, this is not OK. I need to do something about it. He said, let's do something about it. And then he let me do something about it. Um, for which I'm grateful. Um, I also want to thank my reviewers, Dr. Sarah Williams, Amy, Be Dr. Amy Beckman, and Dr. Megan Hupp. And uh, Dr. Corville, I want to say a thank you to you for lending me your uh, GI lymphoma presentation. It had a good, few good talking points. And a, co a, a course, uh, Chris Bergstead, who did a lot of the footwork in, in my data acquisition. And um, as I am at the end of my training, I essentially want to act I uh, thank anyone I interacted with during my training and uh, who taught me because uh, uh, I think this was an integrative uh, uh, project. It's not just clinical, it's not just anatomic, um, and uh, I, I think I have had a well-rounded education here because of you guys, so uh, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Plummer. We have time for a few questions. If it's okay, I'd like to start with one. Yeah. So among your uh, three reviewers in the second phase, I know that there was 100% concordance on the positive cases. Yes. On the negative cases, did you see uh, similar rates of, you know, overall for all the cases, the percent of approved versus not approved? So the negative cases, there was far more variability. I do like my high number of at least one would cancel uh, in 88% of them. But to be honest, uh, I think if you were just having one person, to person in charge of triage, triaging these cases, you wouldn't have such a high number of canceling. In fact, um, I noticed when I was going through the data of the reviewers, there was one in particular that highlighted history of transplant every time it came up. And then I realized these people were not just considering what they were looking at. They were really, really considering the history. <laughs> Um, and I asked them how much the history affected them, and essentially they all said, I take it into consideration a lot. So um, I, I think it's important. It, it's I mean, going to be variable. Implementation of such an algorithm could be challenging, but I think even cutting some of them, I know you and I, when we were, when you were doing uh, either your flow rotation or your lymph node rotation, it's when, when an endoscopist submits six samples at the same time on a patient with a normal exam, you want to kind of try to capture and cancel those, because even though it's a way to, you get, compensated for your work, but it, it creates an enormous burden, particularly on the lab, to just have that kind of bolus of specimens to process and it's of low yield. And I will say in, our, in the algorithm, I mean, 
we ultimately, we will say, we will ask the provider or tell the provider, hey, we don't think this is going to be useful, we're going to cancel it. But I've definitely had providers in the past tell me, I don't care if you think it's use not going to be useful, run it. Um, so they're going to have, the, I guess, the final say-so. Uh, but at least uh, we can give our honest try of better test utilization this way. Yeah? I disagree with the comment that they have the final say-so. I mean, it's a cultural thing. Uh, everybody gets it when the blood bank tells you you can't have blood. Um, but, they, but they get an attitude when uh, you tell them that they can't have another kind of clinical test. This is particularly a problem in very expensive molecular uh, tests that can cost up to $10,000 for all these gene chips that are you know, just a uh, shotgun approach. So I think that's another uh, thing that's in the future is focusing more on certain types of tests that need to be triaged. Uh, and uh, we get these tonsils all the time uh, for lymphoma workup. Uh, if it's an L1B patient, we let them go through. But if it's not, well, we do the same thing you know, with the triage approach. We come and have the touch in front of them, we put some in the fridge, and we wait till the slides come out the next day. And then we say the lymphoma protocol is canceled because of the lymphoma. I will kind of agree with Mark. A lot of it is, and I try to teach our fellows when they're on with us, a lot of it is the confidence with which you convey the information. So, I mean, if you basically say this test is not indicated, I recommend that you cancel it. They're more likely to cancel it. But if, if there's some uncertainty, and this just comes with practice, and that's the importance, I think, of having, uh, I know Dr. Cohn and I agree on this, having the CP residents take a lot of generalist call, mm -hmm. you need to be a clinical consultant. I mean, when I was on flow cytometry, calling and saying, hi, this is Regina Plummer, and explaining why that I think your test is, this test should be canceled, it was far better received if I said, hi, this is Dr. Regina Plummer in pathology. <laughs> if I put doctor in front of that, they're like, oh, yeah, of course, cancel that. It's not just this. There's like a peripheral bloods, so we're getting yeah. a lot of screen peripheral bloods for flow. There's a good Choosing Wisely campaign about not doing this, but it's just kind of slow for people to kind of incorporate that practice. Yes, Dr. Crossan. Regina, thank you very much. I very much enjoyed that presentation. And it reminds me of when residents first come into the residency, we tell them, we're going to train you a little bit in QA, and the residents say, oh my god, no, the QA is so boring. But so you, fun. But, but what you show is the residents are being at the cutting edge of things and the residents are the ones that are to be able to recognize system problems. And this is exactly where the QA uh, projects come in. So thank you very much. In my opinion, if I'm going to be going into a clinical practice, I need to know how to troubleshoot my lab. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that training. I think Dr. Clark had a question. Yeah. yeah I just, I just, what's the protocol? Which markers do you wonder about? Is it like every, every case is the same marker? Or so we have a tissue protocol that puts like the B cell, we have like a viability tube, um, if we can run the viability tube uh, to see how viable the cells are. Um, and then the B cell tube gets preference unless they already have a documented history of a T cell lymphoma. Um, but typically it's the B and the viability tube and we'll throw on a T after that and then if we see abnormal plasma cell population we might add a plasma cell tube. I guess my question is, I mean, I encounter this every once in a while from for brain lymphomas where they say, I'll run flow on it, and they give us a needle biopsy that has 12 million cells in it. <laughs> and, you know, you can't do that. But I just wonder, if, what's the cost relationship between looking at these markers by a scheme versus the flow? And could you, you know, in cases where it does turn out to be a more case, you can you know, we typically just do it by AAC, mm -hmm. actually the brain is not a good number of I just wonder, what's the cost relationship between flow and what it would be possible to do that? I mean, the professional reimbursement for flow cytometry is really low, so I mean, it's about $100 a case. Most of the reimbursements go in on the technical, and that's basically all going to the Fairview Labs. Um, I think there is a standardized lymphoma protocol, so if you want to look at that. It's been basically approved for all three sites. Doctors uh, Colleen, Carter, and uh, Mahmoud have all uh, signed off on it. But it basically kind of shows how you procure the samples for all these. But I think with neuropathology, it, it could be helpful, but I think it's going to be most useful when you have kind of low-grade B-cell lymphomas and maybe T-cell lymphomas. I think a lot of the large-cell lymphomas are pretty easy to, not easy, but 
Um, we, we tend to do IHC on those, those anyway. So IHC interpretation costs more, so I, I think flow is a little bit less, but I honestly, if, if, you, if you have a tissue and you do flow, it's supportive, but people are gonna do the IHC anyway. So I think it's, the, the flow can be most useful in diagnostic dilemmas. Like we had a case that, that you and I had together, that patient that had a kind of a low grade malt lymphoma of the CNS. And we had a, a flow study on a CSF, which was really helpful to kind of put the whole case together. But you couldn't have done flow on tissues. I mean, we could have if we had enough. Well, there weren't enough cells. Yeah, I know. Probably wouldn't have been useful. Yeah. Bartek? Uh, so I had a question. You said 85% were non contributory. Mm -hmm. So are you calling negative results non contributory? I mean, if your, your diagnosis on morphology is adenocarcinoma, would you call a negative flow contributory? <laughs> No, I'm just curious if you make the distinction between negative result or non contributory. I think in some cases it's a pertinent negative. Sorry? I think in some cases it's a pertinent negative. Um, but I think morphology really uh, trumped anything we would have said on flow. But you understand there is a matter of time. We don't know what the morphology would look like. Yes. Two days after we actually get it. By that time, the tissue will be, the sample will be too old to run for all. This algorithm is based on the idea that we have a 24-hour turnaround time, and when I started, we did have a 24-hour turnaround time. I um, think the mucosal so. biopsies get to a pathologist quickly, but they just they trickle down the heme path a lot later. Later, because we they, see them the next by the time morning. we see them, they've been screened by a resident and a fellow, maybe an attending. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just don't. I just thought it would be realistic to triage. But. It, you know, I think there is a lot of value of just looking at ind endoscopically, do they see a mass? So it's not the single cases, but it, when you get six parts at once, and they're all negative, it really puts a lot of burden on the lab. And it will also be helpful, I, I think, um, if we received those six biopsies and we actually had access to the endoscopy report at that time. Um, to say, what the heck did they biopsy, and is it actually a mass, or going to be at all useful? Dr. Colleen, you keep raising your hand. First of all, thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation. Um, you made a comment about the exclusion criteria that nobody under 18 mm -hmm. is included because of the additional IRB effort that was required. Yeah. And I understand exactly where you're coming from, and I've done the same for myself. But I think to myself, if we're all excluding children from these studies, then we're missing a whole age range of people where there might be totally different information or more useful information. Oh, exactly. Burkitt lymphoma, for example, is predominantly in children. Yeah, what are pediatric colleagues think? I mean, it's just the IRB threshold to include children in the study. That's is, the as, as you pointed out, <laughs> a lot more burdensome than just adults. That, that's, the IRB is a whole other issue. Um, I mean, I, I can talk about my IRB woes <coughs> in the last few months. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this new system, right, I tried to renew an IRB. I went over in person, I sat down with an hour with a consultant went through all the procedures to update the IRB, and then someone accidentally canceled my IRB and completely disposed of it. And they couldn't find a way to fix it, so they told me I had to submit a brand new IRB. And that it shouldn't take that long. Now, I barked a little bit so that the uh, chief of staff actually wrote the new IRB for me to implement it, but we really spend an enormous amount of time with this new IRB system, and I think that the, one of the greatest things that could help us is not just having a consultant, but having a person physically to help us enter and manage the IRB system for us. IRB lobbyist. So I think with, and I think the one benefit that we do have is since Mark's over at, uh, on the West Bank, he really takes, uh, I mean, you, you really give so much attention to all the biopsies performed on kids. I think the, your utilization of flow cytometry is a lot different than other practices because you're so heavily involved. Well, thank you for your attention of my lamentations.